so uh, you got a lapel, right? So um, I think, guys, you heard it already, but um, the question, so I'm interested in what, what Jet is going to say, you know, because I actually, I actually answered these questions on my own. So I just wrote some things there just to see how, uh, you know, what he would say. You know, what he said concerning the first question, I, I actually had it written down, but Jet, see. Psalm 139. Yes, awesome. and, and the second Samuel, see. Yeah. So, and so these are the verses I wrote down. So I answered it myself and see, you know, how I would approach this if somebody would ask me, you know. But there's a <laughs> little forward to this. All right. All right, guys. Okay. So the question had to do with how do I, without hurting her feelings, um, talk to her about buying things all the time. Let me, let me, let me tell you how... Well, let me say this. Um, we have an understanding in my marriage relationship. Of course, you know, we've been married 50, almost 51 years. And uh, it, it, it's amazing to me how the longer you're married, the more you begin to think alike. It's almost Twilight Zone-ish, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we have an understanding of, of purchases in our home. Now, I don't know what it's like here. And I, I'll, I'll say this because I think it kind of lead into something else. Um, you know, some churches have a, um, a limit on the amount that a pastor can spend without approval from the church. You know, sometimes it may be up to $500. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if even if that's a part of what you do here. Um, and, and, and a lot of that has to do with just accountability. You know, you, 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 you don't want the pastor, although he has the authority maybe to do it, to go out and buy a $20,000 van just because he wants to buy a van. You know, there has to be some, um, some accountability. I, I think one of the key words in a marriage relationship is the idea of communication. You have to sit down and talk about things uh, together. We have a budget. Now, our budget has drastically changed since May the 16th when we retired from teaching full-time at Heartland Baptist Bible College. Now, we're going to travel this summer with one of the travel groups, so the school has very graciously um, is going to pay us until the 1st of August. But after the 1st of August, all of that income is, is, going, to be, is going to be gone. You know? So we, we've sat down and we've put together a budget uh, my wife and I, every week, uh, we sit down and we, when we reconcile the checkbook, uh, we sit down together once a month when our statement comes in. <laughs> we we uh, sit down and she goes through it and I check them off in the checkbook. I mean, we, it's teamwork. And we work together on, on our budget. Now, there needs to be some kind of liberty in... in uh, in spending in the in in the in the home, for instance, you know, if if um, if, if 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 I'm needing something uh, to help me, to, uh, you know, I, if I need a box of light bulbs because we got to change light bulbs in a the house, they don't last forever. You know, I I don't have to go and talk to my wife about going down to Ace Hardware and buying a box of light bulbs. We have we have kind of an understanding. Um, if, if she needs to buy uh, a bag of potatoes because we need potatoes in the house, she doesn't have to get my permission to do that. We, we, we have this understanding that if it's things that I need for the house to maintain the house, uh, she, she gives me the liberty to do that. If it's things that she needs to, uh, um, you know, to stock the refrigerator, uh, she has the liberty to do that. But we communicate those things um, together. Um, so there, there's two things with, with this question. <laughs> um, that could be a possibility. Here, here's a couple of issues. Number one, it could be that um, the husband's perception of this may be skewed. Um, you know, a, a wife goes out and she buys six cans of green beans. Let's, I'll just pick that one. I just wrote that one down. Six cans of green beans. Well, chances are you're not going to be eating six cans of green beans all at one sitting. But if they're on sale, 
You know, if they're 10 cents a can, I don't know you find 10 cents a can. I mean, I'd buy them, right? So it could be that the husband has a, a skewed perception, or it could be that he's just so stinking tight that he doesn't wear rubber heels because he's afraid they'll give too much. <laughs> Got to think about that a little bit. It could be, and I don't know this, it could be that the wife has a compulsion. <laughs> uh, she can't help herself, you know. Maybe it's, uh, well, she can't help herself. She doesn't want to help herself. That could be the possibility. Um, it's like the guy that his wife was always buying a new dress. Every time she'd come home, she had a new dress. And he said, you can't keep doing this. You know, you're going you're gonna to break us. We can't, can't keep buying a new dress. She says, but you don't understand. I just, when I get in the store and I look at that dress, the devil whispers in my ear, wow, you'd look good in that dress. And I just can't help myself. He said, all right, so here's what I want you to do. Next time you go to the store and you look at a dress and the devil whispers in your ear, you'd look good in that dress. Here's what I want you to tell him. Get thee behind me, Satan. So she goes out shopping, comes back with a new dress. He said, why did you buy a new dress? Did you do what I told you to do? Yes, yes, I saw this dress and the devil whispered in my ear, boy, you look good in that dress. And I said, get thee behind me, Satan. And this voice said, you look good from back here too. <laughs> it's probably not a true story. But I think that woman had a compulsion. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know, sometimes, you know, okay. Guys, we have compulsions. You know? Um, <laughs> I want all my, my shirts hanging in the same direction in my closet. I have a compulsion. I admit that. I have some order in my life. Right? But it could be that she has a, a compulsion that needs to be dealt with. If it's a compulsion, uh, I have a counseling guide for that called cutting the cords. <laughs> it could be that she needs to cut the cords. And again, um, there, here's a couple of ideas that I, that I want to give you. I think maybe it'd be a help. Um, you know, if, if you're the husband that, that, that presented that question, here, here's two things that maybe you could do. Well, three things. Number one, you've got to sit down with your wife and talk. You can't just get mad about it. You have to sit down with your wife and communicate. You've got to communicate. They say, many, many um, marriage counselors say that the number one problem in marriage is what? Communication. And you've got to communicate. So that's the first thing. First thing you need to do is you need to sit down and you need to talk through this. And don't just get mad about it and yell at her. And, 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 and just allow Satan to get a foothold in your life through your anger. So number one, you need to sit down and communicate. Number two, here, here's, here's some things that maybe you can do. You might be able to get a, get a, get a card with a, with a limit on it. You know, as far as uh, the, the amount that, that the, you know, has a limit on it. I, I don't know if they make those or not. I don't, they, maybe they do. I don't know. Possibility. Maybe you could do that. Get a card that's got a limit on it. And that is her shopping card, shopping card. And once that card runs out, that's it. That's it. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the, the, the envelope, cash envelope system? You ever heard of that one? Where nobody's raising your hand, never heard of that? You've heard it? Okay, all right. Where you, to where you, have, you have cash and you put them in an envelope and every envelope is marked for a particular thing like shop, like groceries, um, uh, gas, um, you know, whatever, other, other things that you would have. What other things do you have on your budget? You got groceries, you got, you got fuel, um, huh? Medicine? Okay, all right, medicine, those type of things. What else? Huh? Utilities? Huh? Vacation. Vacation, yeah, yeah, there's probably not much in that envelope, is there? <laughs> What'd you say? Clothing. Huh? Clothes. Clothing. All right. So you could, uh, 
uh, some, some people recommend to use the, the cash envelope um, process. So those are some things. But I do think the biggest thing, the biggest thing that needs to be to done is you got to communicate with one another. Here, 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 you know, here's how we do it. We're men. We just get mad about things. But you got to sit down with your wife and you got to talk through it. You got to develop a budget. I, 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 I would encourage you to do that. You've got to have a budget. If you don't have a budget, you're going to get yourself in, in, in trouble. So you've got to have a budget. All right. Did I answer the question? Sir, I wonder if the one who does that question is a Filipino or an American. Because <laughs> with, the, with the culture, we Filipinos, what is hers is hers, what is mine is hers. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like we don't really like the man very seldom that we manage finances. Okay. Give it to the wife. Okay. Work and work. All right. So let me let me ask this question. Okay, and, and you'll have to forgive my ignorance. Is the Filipino culture a matriarchal culture? You know what I mean by that? Is it run by by the women? Mostly. 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 Okay. All right. So that could come into play there. Again, and I'm, I, I, I don't want this to be a cultural issue as much as it is, as much as it is a lack of communication, lack of communication. So, uh, any other questions? I know, Pastor, you're going to come. You address. Makes more money. Huh? You know, yeah, okay. So that there's that, that can be a, that can be a problem in a marriage. You know, it's her money, my or her money and my money, and never the twain shall meet. That, 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 leads, that leads to conflict. You know, in our home, in our home, it's not her money. It's not my money. It's our money. And that's, that's the way it should be in a marriage. Should it not? You know, it should be that way. You know, because listen, a mar- when you get married, listen, you know, um, a man and a woman shall become one flesh. And everything ought to be one and not each other's. I like the way you said that, though. So, you know, I I, I would encourage you maybe even to, um, to to do a study of Proverbs chapter thirty-one, where it talks about the virtuous woman. Mm-hmm. You know that uh, the virtuous woman is one that you know she's. It, it it kind of implies that she's a businesswoman and she takes care of some some things and 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 so that you know I I don't when my wife says listen we new, need new curtains for the house. I don't care if, go get whatever you need because that's her haven, yes, right? Your, your home is your wife's haven and I, you know, I, and I want her to be able to have the liberty to do those things within reason. So the, the way you figure that out is you sit down and you communicate with one another. You put together a budget. If you don't have a budget, let me encourage you to do that, to do that, Pastor here, you want your mic? Thank you, Brother Jet. Appreciate the, the wisdom in that. I do agree with Brother Jet, spot on. Um, I think with men, what sometimes may f- become an issue is we assume that the wife might know what we're thinking about. Um, sometimes the wife might not even know that we're upset because she goes to the discount store and buys all these kind of things. And, uh, and for us, we look at it, man, this is not practical. Our cubbies are full, our pantries are full, and sometimes we don't communicate it as, though, as it was already said, you know. And then therefore, we just get, kind of get angry and blow up, <laughs> you know, like clam up, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that's kind of wrong for us to do, you know, and, and sometimes we just, uh, I, I did jot down some thoughts, and I, I'm, the first thing I put down was communicate by the jet. Um, then I, I added something with that, communicate with love and understanding. You know, uh, how we say things can become, uh, you know, you could say I love you in two different versions. <laughs> you know, the same words are said. You know, a woman can translate in a different way. You know, I love you or I love you, honey. You know, so, yeah. so and then, uh, and I think coming from the part that I need to understand why she does this, I think it's a, it's, it's a part that I would say that's hard for me as a man. 
you know, they're just, since we're just men and boys here, I think it's hard for a man to not give the answer right away. <laughs> you know, let's say if your wife is talking to you, the way your brain, or the way my brain works, I can speak about how your brain works, we want to solve things right away. Yeah. We have the solution, we are leaders, we, this is the way it is. Before they even finish what they're going to say, we want to give the answer out. I think understanding or empathy, uh, empathy is not just understanding them, but understanding their feelings with them, you know, and that's one of the ways. And I think this is all the things that Buddhist just said, just maybe I say it in a different way, um, stewardship, you know, but it's just said it, budgeting, you know, so just understanding what the budget is. And then, uh, you know, uh, you had to come up with an agreement. You know, uh, I think I would call it mutual agreement. You know, it's like, okay, what does she really need and what she want and what do I need? I like to go do this. I like, I don't have to, like he said, I love the illustration. I don't want to have to ask my wife to buy light bulbs. I mean, those are practical things in life. So how do we do that not to offend? I think that's, an, that's a, how do I say these things without being hurtful? Again, in communication, seek mutual agreement through that communication. And then uh, I think a lot of the things that we need to understand in life is contentment. Contentment is a learned, uh, it's learned. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, the Apostle Paul said this, I've learned whatsoever state I am, there we to be content. Yeah. And I think both ways. I have to be content with the wife that God gave me. And also she has to be content as well with the things that God has given her as well. You know, contentment. You know, and uh, gentle correction is what I think needs to be done. <laughs> you know, gentle correction is just, uh, you know, grievous words stirred up strife. You know, you just want to start a problem, just say some harsh words, and words are not tactful. And I, 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 would, I have to admit, you know, I've been at that side that I said things to my wife that were not tactful, or they were grievous words, and guess what happens? It stirred up strife because my words weren't, you know, and again, that's communication, as Brother Jess already said. And, uh, you know, I learned this from him. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. We'll give it unto all men liberally and abrade it now and it shall be given. That's, that's one of the most important things I learned in Bible college. And I learned that from Brother Judge, just quoting that all the time in, in biblical counseling class. Just ask God for wisdom and how to deal with this. And hopefully when you navigate through this, you know, remember you're the stronger vessel. She's the weaker vessel. You know, and the Bible commands us to dwell with them in knowledge. If, how many of you like to go shooting? I, I like to go shooting. How many of you like to go golfing? So some of you guys go to golfing. Some of you guys know, like basketball. Some of you guys have real interest in certain hobbies. You know, you study those hobbies, right? You get to know those hobbies. Some of you guys have, a, you know, uh, you, could, you could name certain kind of guns, you know, certain kind of ammos. Um, you know them. You learn them. You study them. You spend time with them. You know how to shoot that ball. You got to know your wife. Yes. You got to spend time with them. Got to learn them. Or her. <laughs> That's right. You only have one wife. <laughs> you know, you got to learn her. Understand her. Know her more than your hobbies. Know her more than your, um, your recreations. You have a career. Some of you have masters and high-ranking military. You, you got up there because you learned it and you studied it. Well, how much more is your marriage? You know, um, it's important, you know, important. So you, you would fight for your country, right, man? You, some of you have fought for your country. You would fight for your wife, not against her, <laughs> that kind of thing. So those are the things that I think Buddy Jet communicated well with communication. All those has to do with one thing, you know, communicating the right way. So, well, Buddy Jet. It's all yours, okay? So. All right, he mentioned one word, and I want to focus on that. What I, oh, there it is. Uh, stewardship. What, what should be, as a Christian couple, the very first thing that you should have on your budget? Your giving. Uh, because if you're not good stewards with what God's given you through your giving... You're, you're not going to honor God the way that you're supposed to. So 
You know, um, if, you're, if you're not giving, if you're not giving to the church, if you're not giving your tithes and missions and offerings, let me encourage you, you need to start doing that. I, I'm sorry, the Bible says that you, you've, the children of Israel, how did they rob God? By not giving their tithe. And uh, so, you know, that should be one of the very first things that you do on your budget. So, all right, we're going to continue on uh, tonight. I have so much stuff that I worked through today, and I don't know that I'll be able to get it all in. I don't know how long my wife's going to go, how long we need to go through here. How long? 30 minutes? 830? Okay, I think we can do that. All right, you remember last night at, when I started off, we talked about those five different, um, um, five different activities that we need to be involved in uh, to be spiritually well. Meditation was the first one uh, that we discussed last night. And uh, then we talked about awe, how that we need to be in awe of who God is. Um, Jeremiah understood who God was in Jeremiah chapter 3. Pastors kind of got that as his, I mean, in Lamentations chapter 3. We should be in awe of who God is, you know, and what He's done. What has He done for you? He's given you eternal life. He's provided for you a way for you to spend eternity in heaven forever and ever and ever. He's obligated Himself to meet your needs. And He's given you a home in heaven when you die. So there's, there's a lot of things that we need to, to think about when it comes to awe. And um, one of the things that I want to talk about tonight is the third one in that, in that process of um, five things of spiritual, um, spiritual wealth or spiritual health is the word forgiveness. So what I want you to do tonight, if you would is take your Bibles, and we're going to go to the Hebrews uh, chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. And uh, we're going to talk about bitterness and forgiveness tonight. And uh, I hope to be able to, uh, to, to give you some things that will be a help uh, this evening. Hebrews chapter 12. And um, somebody stand, do this for me. Will you do this? Somebody stand up and read verse number 15. If you're, if you're able to do that, you want to do that for me, read verse 15 of Hebrews chapter number 12. Anybody want to do that? All right, go ahead right here. Go ahead, brother, stand up. 12, 15. Yes. Thereby many be defiled. All right, so we're going to talk about bitterness. Um, Bitterness is like um, an infectious disease. In 2017, um, but we were traveling with Glory Bound, the men's quartet, and we had to leave um, because my, my, um, my kids are in the ministry, and uh, so we had, to, um, we had to come home for a couple of weeks because our my daughter and her husband are going to camp, and I'm, I'm grabbing my phone for a reason. I'll show you here in a minute. And uh, so we came home to watch our two grandsons, Isaac and uh, Ian. And so um, we we did all kinds of little tours of of Oklahoma. I, I, Oklahoma is really kind of a, a neat state. We have a we we have a, a little Sahara area, state park, where they've got sand dunes, kind of like the Sahara Desert. And we've got a, another place uh, called um, Alabaster Cam Caverns, and there's another place where you can, uh, the Great Salt Plains, and you go out there and dig up crystals. Just a lot of cool places for people to, uh, to tour. So we, we took our grandsons on a little tour. And uh, so while we were out, uh, we were stayed at a hotel in Altus, Oklahoma, southwest corner of the state of Oklahoma. And uh, so we, we got to the hotel, and, and I took off my pants, and I had a red spot right in the middle of my kneecap. And uh, so I told my wife, I said, it looks like I got some kind of a bite. And so the next day we got up, we were taking the boys back to Tulsa to their grand, other grandfather, 
And uh, th that red spot now had a red circle around it. And I said, well, I think maybe we ought to, when we drop the boys off, we ought to stop at a clinic. And we're coming through the north side of Oklahoma City, and we have a Mercy Hospital. So we dropped in and went into the urgent care. And I took my pants down and let the guy see my knee. And, you know, and the spot around the knee was about that big. And he said, oh, you need to keep an eye on that because, uh, you know, you, you may have to have some antibiotics. You need to come back tomorrow. And I said, well, I can't come back tomorrow. We're getting on an airplane to go to New York City to meet up with Glory Bound with a quartet. He said, well, keep an eye on it. So the next day, we got on the airplane. We flew to New York City. And when we got to the church, they had a missions apartment where we stayed in. Uh, I pulled up my pants leg. And this is what that little red spot on my leg looked like. And so I went to a urgent care clinic and they said, uh, you got to go to the emergency room. So I went to the emergency room and showed them my leg and they immediately admitted me into the hospital. Now, they think it was probably a brown recluse spider. We have a lot of those in Oklahoma and they bite you. You don't even know they, they, they bite. It just... So the, the, the ink mark on it is they're showing the direction of the the uh, infection running up my leg, okay? So that's the first picture. Then it went from my left knee to my right foot. I don't know if you can see my right foot, it's red. And so it, it became sepsis, which is a bad thing. <laughs> and so they put me on four different antibiotics. And uh, so that, that's just another view of it. And by the time we finished up, Oh, I think I'm going the wrong way here. i got to find the other pictures. But there's another view from the top. It just keeps getting larger and larger and larger. And then by the time we got finished up, it looked like that. <laughs> yeah. So, Yeah. And uh, there's another picture of it. Uh, the, this is the last day. We ended up going into a hotel. And uh, they, this, is, this is the day that they let me out of the hospital. So they let me out of the hospital, put me in the hospital on Wednesday. I got out of the hospital on Saturday evening and got up the next day and preached for Brother Pete Montoro there in Queens. And I didn't even know where I was at, hardly. <laughs> so this is the last day. That's what it looked like. And then the next day on Monday, we got in the van and drove and finished up the tour with, with Glory Bound. So spider bites are not fun. And uh, so they, they um, put me on these different antibiotics. Um, but you know, you know what? Bitterness can be just like a spider bite. It, 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 it can spread. It's like an infectious disease. It's, it's, it's allowing, it's, it's, bitterness is this, it's allowing a sliver of anger or disappointment or disillusionment to fester and grow infected. How many have ever gotten a, a splinter in your, in your finger and it got infected? I had, I had, um, I, get, I had one that got down on the side of my thumb here and, and it was just sore and red and swollen and, and one day I was mashing on it and all of a sudden this piece of wood, this sliver comes out with all this pus around it and I almost passed out. But you know that's what, that was, that's what bitterness can become in your life. It can become an infectious disease in the life of people. So let's talk about here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. The Bible gives us this idea, an explanation of bitterness. Verse 15. Looking diligently, lest, uh, I'm sorry, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, so what does God use? And I got a little picture here. I want to thought about making copies of it. I know it's here somewhere. Um, I think 
what I do with it. So what does God use to describe uh, the, uh, what bitterness is like? What does he use in this verse? Do you see it? It's the word root. Do you see that? Okay. I got I to gotta find that picture. It'll help you. Okay. Who stole my picture? Well, never mind. I had a picture of a tree. And, uh, and, it, and it, it had the root system underneath it. Um, now, I, I'm from Texas. You're, 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 you live in Texas now. You're not originally from Texas. But I was born in Texas. And the old saying is, you know, I'm Texas born and Texas bred. And when I'm dead, I'm Texas dead. <laughs> I'm not quite that bad. But I, I was born in Texas. And uh, in Texas, we have a tree down there called a mesquite tree. Anybody familiar with a mesquite tree? Uh, it actually grows some beans on it, and it's got thorns about an inch long. The interesting thing about a mesquite tree is that you, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like a bush, but the root system can travel out 50 yards. One tree, 50 yards. Because it grows in areas where there's not a lot of water, so those roots grow everywhere that they can find. And you can go out there and you can cut the tree down, but if you don't kill the roots, that tree's going to keep growing. You ever done that? You ever had a tree that you cut down in your yard? And all of a sudden you look out in the yard and you got all these little sprouty things growing up in the yard? Do you know why that happens? Because the root's still alive. And, 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 and Paul says that, the, that bitterness is like a root. And, and, and that's what it, he describes this bitterness that, that people have. It's a part of, of, of this root system, you know. And, 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 you know, you don't see the roots from the, from the surface. But listen, someone who is bitter may not want to reveal the true reason for their attitudes and their actions. They may have buried their pain deep down within them, but that's still causing them the misery that they have in their life. And often the root of the plant is bigger than the plant itself. Like those, those mesquite bushes. It can grow up 50 feet, 50 feet. The root system can grow 50 feet from the very spot where the tree is at. And unless you get rid of the roots, the plant continues to grow. Now, I'm not much of a fan of yard work. In fact, my wife and I just bought a house on the south side of Oklahoma City. And, um, and it's a gated community. And we pay an HOA and they mow my yard for me. I'm kind of liking that. Because <laughs> I hate yard work. Now, it's a part of the curse, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I hate yard work. I hate yard work. And uh, if I had enough money, I'd pay 50 guys. Well, there's about 50 guys that come into our neighborhood and take care of all the yards in our gated community. But I tell you what, <laughs> now my wife, she just, bless her heart, I, I try... But if I go out in my yard and I see a, a, um, a weed growing in my yard, you know what I go out there and do? Even though they take care of my yard for me, I'm out there pulling the weeds. But if you don't get the roots, guess what happens? The weed comes right back, doesn't it? It does. It does. And, 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 and so if we don't learn to, to get the root of bitterness out of our life, It'll, 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 it'll keep growing and growing and growing. Now, I, I want you to notice what he says here in verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail. Notice this next phrase. Of the grace of God. Aren't you glad for the grace of God? <laughs> you know, have, you, you've heard these definitions, right? Grace is God giving to us that we don't deserve. You didn't deserve heaven. You didn't deserve Jesus to die on the cross. But yet God's grace gave that to you. And, and you've heard this in of mercy, right? Mercy is God not giving to us what we do deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve to spend eternity in hell forever and ever. But yet God 
in His what? Grace and mercy provided a sacrifice for us. What I think that Paul is talking about here is, is this phrase. He's talking about living grace. Living grace. Here's what that means. When we give good to others, hey, 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 listen, even if they don't deserve it, that's living grace. God gives to you what you do not deserve. Living grace. That is the grace that fails. Did you notice this? Looking diligently, lest any man, what's the word that he uses next? Fail of the grace of God. Here's what happens. When you and I become bitter, that grace fails. Meaning that we treat others with that bitter spirit that's growing within us. What does he say bitterness leads to? Did you see that in verse 15? Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby, thereby many be what? What's the next word? Be defiled. Did you know that bitterness in my life and in your life leads to defilement? And defilement just simply means, defiled just simply means this, contamination. And a person who is bitter not only contaminates themselves, but notice what he says. How many? Many be defiled. When you and I are bitter, not only do we contaminate ourselves, but many are contaminated because of our bitterness. Here's what I'm talking about. Others are affected and infected and hurt because of a bitter, bitter person's actions and attitudes. Did you know your family can be infected because of a parent's bitterness? Your workplace can be infected because of one employee's bitterness. A church, I have seen it, a church can be infected because of one person's bitterness. Right. First church I pastored as a little bitty church in East Texas, a town of 1,500 people. There were five Baptist churches in this town of 1,500 people. And all of them but one were, were, a, a, were a split off of each other. Five Baptist churches. I pastored this church... And while we were there, the church celebrated its 25th anniversary. Now get this. In 25 years, they've had 22 pastors. In 25 years, 22 pastors. There were three generations. Grandparents, parents, and their kids that grew up not liking each other. Somewhere back, way back yonder in the in the early days of Bible Baptist Church in Hugh Springs, Texas. I shouldn't have told you where it was at. Somewhere back in there, somebody did something to somebody and it carried on through three generations. And it was like there was a wall built right down the middle of the building. You know what happened? Somebody way, way back yonder got bitter. And it defiled the whole church. I was there two and a half years. Almost broke a record for the longest tenure <laughs> as the pastor of that church. Now, now, you know, God blessed while we were there. And we had a, had a, a great ministry. But I'm just telling you, you, bitterness can defile a church. Right. It can defile your family. It can ruin your life. If you allow that root of bitterness to continue to grow in your life, it will ruin your life. So now let's talk about some remedies for bitterness. Can I do that? I said, absolutely. You're the one that's preaching, so you do whatever you want to do. So let me, let, me, let me give you some help here. Can I give you some remedies for bitterness? Are you ready? Number one, the very first remedy for bitterness is encompassed in one word, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. When you find it, I want somebody to stand up and say, Sword of the Lord, and read the verse. Ephesians 4, 32. Stand up and say, Sword of the Lord. Okay, read it. Amen. The preacher's kid. That's the way it should be done. Okay. Okay. 
All right, I was talking when you started reading it. Stand read it again. I'll quit talking. I want you to hear the first part of this first. Read it again. You still got it? Okay. All right. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as what? God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We are to forgive the same way that God forgives us. Now, I, I, I wrote down a couple of verses here. I want to I read you these verses Isaiah 43 25. Listen to this. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. You know what the word blotteth means? It means to erase it. it Albert Barnes says it this way. It's a financial term. Keeping accounts where when a debt is paid, the charge is blotted or canceled. Thus God says he blotted out the sins of the Jews. He forgave them. He blotted them out. How about this one? Jeremiah 31, 34. For I will, be, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Let me ask you this question. How is it possible for an all-knowing God to forget our sin. How do you think that's possible? Is it because he's absent-minded? That's, that's not what that means. You know what it means? It means this. He chooses to not remember them. Yes, sir. He chooses to not bring them up. He chooses to put them as far as the east is from the west. Have you ever thought about that? Why did he say east to west and not north to south? I don't know if I can explain it that way, but if you start in the north and go south, eventually you end up back in the north. Think about the globe. If you start in the east and you go west, you never reach the west. It's a, it's a never-ending process. And that's what God does with our sin. He casts them behind his back. He chooses to not remember them anymore. So the one word that I think that encompasses us trying to be to that place where we forgive is the one remedy for, for bitterness is the word forgiveness. We, so, okay, so we're not only to forgive, we are to forego. We are to forego. Now, I have, I have helped people who've gone through horrible treatment by other people. Um, we have helped young ladies who had been molested by a relative to try to walk through that. And, uh, and that, that, that's, that's one of the most traumatic things that people can go through. We, we go through things in our lives that are traumatic. And when I say that you're not only to forgive, I'm not saying that what they did was right or, or, or wasn't offensive in your life. It, here, here's what I am saying. When we choose to forgive, we choose to give up our claim to get even with them. Here's what we tend to do. Somebody does us wrong, what do we say? They don't know who they're messing with. Right? Maybe you don't say it exactly that way, but we tell them, we, we say to ourselves, I'll get them back. Forgiveness means that we choose to not get even. When there isn't true forgiveness, here's what takes place. Retaliation takes place. Uh, we're we're going to look at Hebrew or uh, Romans chapter twelve tomorrow night. We talk about you know repairing ruptured relationships. So I'm not going to go there yet. But retaliation doesn't take place when there is true forgiveness. 
replaying the offense over and over again doesn't mean that we've forgiven. Rehearsing the offense takes place when we start talking to others. I, I want to give you this, this biblical example. Joseph, his life is an example of how to forgive. We wrote a counseling guide, for the, a children's counseling guide on bullying. And the main character of this counseling guide on bullying is Joseph. You think about it. He was bullied by his brothers. They threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. He was bullied by Potiphar's wife, wasn't he? She set her cap on him, right? She said, lie with me. He said, no, I can't do this great sin, this great wickedness and sin against God. He was bullied by his brothers. He was bullied by Potiphar's wife. He was bullied by Potiphar who threw him in prison because his wife lied about him. He was bullied. But yet, how did he respond? Let me read these verses to you. But as for you, this is addressed to his brothers. Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. That is a true picture of forgiveness. True picture of forgiveness. Would you say that he had every right to retaliate, humanly speaking? But yet he chose not to because he chose to forgive, chose to forgive. All right, I'm going to wrap this up with a couple of things here. Bitter people can't appreciate the sacrifice that people make for them who love them. You know, I, I'm not a, a fan of this, but you know, Winnie the Pooh. You ever heard Winnie the Pooh stories, right? How many are familiar with some of the characters? Of Winnie the Pooh. You got Winnie the Pooh. Huh? Eeyore. Eeyore. Who else you got? Tigger. Kanga. Tigger. Right? Huh? Yeah. All right. So I thought, of, I thought of Eeyore. Okay. Let me give you an example. Reminds me of Eeyore. You know, Eeyore is described as the great old gray donkey. He has a poor opinion of others. And he describes them as only gray fluff that's blown into their heads by mistake. That's his description of the other animals. He lives in an area, listen to this, called Eeyore's Gloomy Place. Rather boggy and sad. He usually expects misfortune to come to him, accepts it when it does, and rarely tries to prevent it. His catchphrase is, I'm trying to do Eeyore's voice. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> His pessimistic outlook was seen in an encounter with Piglet, who cheerfully said, Good morning, Eeyore. And Eeyore replied, Well, I suppose it is for some. <laughs> in one part of the video clip, he says, End of the road, nothing to do. No hope of things getting better. Sounds like Saturday night at my house. That's a description of people who are bitter. Pessimistic about everything. So how do we get rid of bitterness? Can I give you some of these? We're almost done. Stick with me. Number one. The first step to removing bitterness is repentance. Luke 15. Let's go there real quick. Luke chapter 15. Familiar story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15. The first step to remove bitterness in my life and your life is repentance. Luke 15, look at verse 15. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. 
And when he, would have, when, when he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. I want you to think about how humiliating this is for a Jewish boy to take care of pigs. Right? So look at verse, seven, verse uh, 17. And when he came to himself... He said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, here it is. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Do you know what that is? That's repentance. That's not sorry for where he's lying in a pig's pen. That's repentance. So the first step to overcoming bitterness in my life and your life is repentance. He lay in a pig pen, humiliating for a Jewish boy. He was rebellious. He was spiteful but toward everyone. But then, he, the, then the Bible says that he came to himself. Literally it means this, that at a point in his life he lost his mind. But when he came to himself, a change of mind is true biblical repentance. Step number two, repentance and return. Look at verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Step number two is return. He changed his mind. Oh, this is so good. I, I, I wish I had time to go into more detail with this. Do you know a change of mind leads to a change of action? Changed thinking produces changed behavior. So when he changed his thinking, his behavior changed. Number three, step number three is to refocus. Refocus. We already read verse 18. Look at verse number 19. And am no more worthy to be called thy son and make me as one of thy hired servants. So here's what he did. You got to get this. He refocused in who his father was and what his father could do for him. Do you see that? He refocused on who his father was and what his father can do for him. So if we're going to overcome bitterness, we got to learn to be thankful. We're going to talk about that as another step. Um, I don't know if it's tomorrow night. I don't remember if it's the night after. But I'll just say this, and, and, and it's in my notes for later, but I have discovered, Brother, Brother Carlos, that... People that have become, that have ceased to be thankful are troubled people. That's right. Troubled people. Amen. So practical steps in overcoming bitterness. Here's what you need to do. Number one, you need to ask God to forgive your bitterness. And to put the offense off and not to remember it again. Number two, start writing down good things that God has done in your life. Three times a day. Three times a day. You know, let, let me give you this. Get some three by five cards and, and put the date on it. And in the morning and at noon and at night, you write down three things that you're thankful for. You got three things to be thankful for. At least three things every day. Start, start doing that. Take some time to realize... Man, God, you've done a lot for me. Three times a day. And if you've become bitter toward a person or a situation in your life, here, here, here's what I, here's what I, here, when we're doing marriage counseling, I, have, I give them three by five cards. I give them the cards. I write the date down. I want you to write down three things about your wife that you're thankful for. And I've had them look at me and go, what? Three things about my wife that I'm thankful for? And you'd be surprised when they come back the next week. 
They got them written down. So if you're bitter toward another person, let me encourage you to do this. Write down three things about the person that you're thankful for. Because it's really hard for you to be bitter towards somebody when you're writing down three things about them that you're thankful for. Does that make sense? Because it's not about you. It's about forgiveness. It's about you overcoming bitterness in your life. I, I had this as an example, but chose not to go into it. But you, 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 you think about Naomi. Did, did you know Naomi means blessed, I think, something along that line? But when she came back, you know what she said? Don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. You know what Mara means? Bitter. And she was bitter, wasn't she? But look what God did <laughs> in Naomi's life. Amazing, amazing what God did in her life. Finally, she got her eyes off of her problems. And when she focused on Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. Boaz, by the way, is a type of Christ, isn't he? She was greatly blessed because of Boaz and Ruth. So listen, as bad as things were in her life and as bad things are in our lives, here's what we need to do. We need to focus on God and His forgiveness. Do you deserve God's forgiveness? If you raise your hand and say, yes, sir, I do, there, <laughs> you're something wrong. Because none of us here, we don't, I don't deserve God's forgiveness. Aren't you grateful that God forgives? Amen. He not only forgives, but He chooses to forget. Bitterness. It's a root springing up. It defiles a lot of people. It'll defile you, and it defiles everybody around you. Let's pray. Father, You're so good to us, and we are thankful for everything that You do in our lives for the remedies that you give us in your word to help us to overcome bitterness in our hearts and our lives. Help us, Lord, to understand that we need to forgive others the way that you forgive us. We don't deserve their, uh, your forgiveness. It may be that people have harmed so many, uh, harmed us, and they may not deserve forgiveness, but we are not to forgive them for our sake. We are for, to forgive them for Christ's sake. So ju just bless these men. Thank you for them in your name. Amen. All right, Pastor. Thank you, Bridge. Amen. What a blessing. Well, definitely that's something that we need to keep our heart guarded because bitterness can defile many. And, you know, just to be honest with you, you know, I caught myself starting to lean to that side of my life because somebody said something about me or somebody did something maybe to somebody that's close to me or even somebody that's close to me did something to me and they betray you or a friend or a relative or whatever, you, you, you could fill in the blank, you know, whoever that person is in your life. But you know, the forgiveness that really Brother Jet talked about is the same forgiveness that God gave us. Right. And that's, do I deserve it? Neither do they deserve it. <laughs> but. We exercise forgiveness because simply this is a Christ-like thing. It's, uh, I, think, I think the verse before that said, Let all bitterness and wrath and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake had forgiven you. What a joy. What a joy. Thank you, Brother Jet, for that. Look forward for tomorrow. So, blessing. And uh, tomorrow is an interesting question. So, uh, I will tell you tomorrow what it is. <laughs> you got to show up. Somebody gave us an interesting question, and we're going to address it. You know, um, it's more like a theological thing, I think, that uh, more than anything else. You know, but we'll, we'll, we'll trust the Lord in it. All right, let's come to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing. Uh, let's see. Let's ask one of these young men to pray. Uh, see, Virgil, he pray and ask God's blessing. He's just stand and uh, come here. Let me give you a mic. All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this day. Please forgive us for all our sins. And I thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together for this conference. Thank you for Brother Jed and his message. And uh, please bless the rest of this night and the rest of the conference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We're dismissed.